We Love Bookstores series of events. I'm so excited to say that we've raised nearly $1,100 for Adobe Books. And uh, we've sold over 210 tickets. And uh, thus far, the We Love Bookstores events have raised over $55,000 for local San Francisco Bay Area bookstores, which I'm so incredibly thrilled about. And this is just such a wonderful panel of authors that I'm just so incredibly excited to, to hear from all of you. And, you know, uh, I think if we could just start off by having everybody introduce themselves and just say a little bit about your work and, and you know, your relationship to, to your, your gender identity and, and being in America or wherever you are right now. That'd be amazing. I guess if we can go alphabetical, I guess Cyrus? No, Jennifer, Jennifer first. Is that me? Yes. Um, if it's me, then hi, I'm Jenny Boylan. Um, I'm talking to you from Maine. Um, and uh, I've written a lot, of, a lot of books. Most of them are about um, transgender experience. And um, I read a column for the New York Times every other Wednesday. Sometimes it's about trans stuff. Sometimes it's about dogs and pizza. Um, and it's such an honor for me to be here with all these great trans and, and or non-binary writers, um, most of whom are younger than I am and who represent the energy of the new generation. Um, and it's interesting to me how this movement, I think, is constantly being reinvented and reinformed by um, uh, as, as history goes on. So I'm, I'm here as much to listen as to participate. And thank you for having me here. Yeah, and I guess now Cyrus, sorry. Hi. Don't worry. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cyrus Dunham. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a writer. I, um, I published my first book this past October. It's called A Year Without a Name. I am also an organizer. I live in Southern California and I work with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners um, and the Coalition to End Life Without Parole Sentencing in the state of California. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm super excited to be here with you all. I love that we're supporting local bookstores, especially right now. I'm like with, this is a conversation with many writers who have shaped me and who I admire. So I feel, I feel quite humbled. Um, and I'm so curious to see what we'll get into today because it's a incredibly, um, we're at a real inflection point, I think around a lot of a lot of questions and a lot of issues, particularly how the so-called trans movement, which I'm sure we'll get into <laughs> making sense of today, relates to larger struggles for, you know, ending violence and oppression. Um, and I, I kind of just want to listen and hear what you all have to say, because it's a rare opportunity that I would get to, to, to be with all of you in the same digital room. <laughs> Yay, and, and Vivek. Oh, wow. Hi. Uh, my name is Vivek Shreya, and I am here in Calgary in Canada. Uh, for those of you in America who don't know what Calgary is uh, or where Calgary is, let's just say it's close to Vancouver. Uh, I am a musician and a filmmaker and I've written a bunch of books. Most recently, um, the subtweet, which just came out uh, a couple months ago. It's a novel um, about brown female friendship. And uh, to echo what Cyrus just said, I'm so honored to be in conversation with so many people that I actually really admire and look up to. So thank you so much, uh, Charlie, for, for in inviting me and for uh, organizing this. Cool. And gosh, I can do, al I can do alphabets. Uh, Tony, I think you're next. I don't know. Hi, I'm Tony Newman. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Uh, I'm a consultant with the Strang Tra Transgender Strategy Center. My memoir came out uh, about five or six years ago. I rise to transformation of Tony Newman, detailing how uh, I overcame as a Southerner in North Carolina and becoming a trans woman of color. The book, I Rise, comes out in hard copy, hopefully next year. And uh, me and several other Black and Latino trans women are working on a book called Black Trans Lives Matter. Some of the top trans women from Pose and others we will be putting in there to talk about their experiences with living in America um, as a trans person of color. So I've got two books I hope to have coming out in the next two years. And uh, this is a really interesting time to talk about uh, being trans in America um, and especially being trans and a person of color. Thank you and glad to be here. 
Meredith, hi. Um, hi, uh, my name is Meredith Thompson. I am a journalist and I am uh, now a memoirist. I, I just published um, Fairest, um, which is a memoir um, about my life as, a, as an albino person who grew up in the Philippines and moved to the States um, and eventually um, transitioned and um, and um, and I've also worked as a journalist on, you know, for the past six years now um, on investigative features and um, and essays on trans experience. And it's yeah, and it's incredible to have um, all of these wonderful people um, in the same room and, you know, talking about trans issues. And finally, Alok. Hi. Hi everyone, my name is Alok, like tell me a joke Alok. I'm an Indian, trans feminine, gender non-conforming writer and performance artist. And I most recently published a book called Beyond the Gender Binary, insisting that a world beyond binary gender will create one that celebrates creativity over conformity. And I'm so excited to be on this panel with so many people I love and admire. Yay! So Today is Juneteenth and, you know, Meredith suggested that we start off by talking about, you know, intersecting oppressions and different, you know, our, you know, intersecting marginalizations and what it means for us to come together and the different layers of struggle that marginalized people have had to face in the United States. So, I don't know, since you suggested the question, Meredith, do you want to sort of start us off? I think, you know, like I think when we were discussing the panel and, you know, and sort of picked a date for the panel, right, like that preceded um, the, you know, George Floyd and, you know, the events of the past few weeks. And so I feel like, at least for me, I'm still, you know, like I'm at a point where um, I'm still figuring out not just, you know, how I want to move through the world, um, you know, in the next month, but what this moment is going to mean for us, you know, in the next year, in the next five years um, for our lifetimes. And I, and I guess like for me, I just wanted to, you know, to sort of like provide us with space in order to, you know, in order to, for me to express, you know, myself, you know, just speaking for myself, kind of express that, um, you know, point of contemplation, because I've been aware of Juneteenth, but it's the first time that I've seen it in, you know, like I've seen the holiday in kind of a national public consciousness. And, um, and yeah, you know, so I'm here as much to listen as anything else. Anybody else want to jump in? Well, this is Tony from Los Angeles. Uh, it's an interesting time as an African-American person and then as an African-American trans person. Um, it's kind of a double uh, discriminatory thing going on here. Where we've had 19 uh, trans women of color in 2020 who've been murdered so far. And it's just that uh, trans women of color, um, as well as um, Black men and women, uh, seem to get killed at high rates, and we seem to get killed at higher rates than most um, in America. So um, I think this movement is is overdue, and uh, Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and Black Trans Lives Matter is uh, is my new ideology. It's, it's where I'm at now. Uh, so that's, that's it for me. Anybody else want to add anything to that, or...? Well, I, I can say that as um, an older transgender person, um, what I've, I've noticed is the way the discourse around trans lives um, has changed. I mean, I've, I've been out for almost, almost well, 20 years, almost 25 years now. And um, I've seen, you know, things have changed really quickly. Um, or it seems, it seems quickly looking back at it. But you know, um, uh, what's the good news about all of the about this terrible era that we're living in 
is that the narrative is changing again. And that I think we're recognizing that there are, um, there are a lot of ways of being trans, there's a lot of ways of being non-binary and there's not a kind of, and there shouldn't be a kind of, you know, um, you know, de default um, story. And I say this with some self-consciousness because um, I think for a long time, like in the 90s and in the 2000s, um, in terms of in like, you know, the, the, you know, television and major media and stuff, kind of nice, nice older white ladies of, of privilege like me were like the only people you almost ever heard from. Um, not that they treated us with particular particular respect either, but um, uh, television and film um, has not been good. Well, it's almost never been good about showing trans lives, but it's it's been particularly bad at showing lives um, unlike the lives of white people of privilege. So here we are now at this moment when um, the narrative is changing. And what I'm hoping is that um, we're gonna um, we're gonna hear we're gonna hear more stories. People are gonna understand the the diversity of of our community and understand that that diversity is is its is its strength. Is that fair to say? I hope so. I think so. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I guess I'll just say that it's really important for me as a non-black trans person to think through the historical indebtedness that I have and that the trans community has to the black liberation struggle, especially considering current events with the Supreme Court judgment, so much of the architecture of trans rights in this country comes from legacies of black resistance and civil rights. And I think that's why all this organizing going on around black trans lives matter is so important in particular to um, continue to resource Black trans-led organizations, which have for so long been disenfranchised, even within the trans organizational space. <clears throat> Vivek, do you have anything to add, or or, or no, Cyrus? I, mean, or? I, I feel like everything that I, I would wanted to say, everyone has articulated a lot better than mm -hmm. I have, and I think my perspective is a little bit different as well, just being in Canada. So yeah, I think every everyone has said wonderful things. I mean, it'd be interesting to think if we go to the not just the you know the, the half a dozen of us uh, um, talking rectangles here, but also everybody who's 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 listening. Who was the first transgender person whose story you knew? Um, where did your understanding of trans lives come from? And you know, um, I I think I might have already been out for a couple of years before I knew about Sylvia Rivera. Um, you know, I I'm I might have been. Yeah, I mean, the first people that I knew about were like Jan Morris um, mm -hmm. and um, like Renee Richards, you know, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not really proud of, of that, but it's, it's the fact that like that's, that's, that's what reached me when I was 13, year, 13 years old, you know, in suburban Philadelphia. Um, and so... I mean, maybe maybe those stories spoke to me or reached me because I felt that those were lives kind of like mine, even though I didn't play tennis. Um, but um, it, it, I mean, wasn't you know you come out, um, you try to find your way in the world as a trans person, and then you realize after all of that, at least I realized how much homework there still is to do, and how to understand that when you open your mouth, you're not at least for me, you're not you're not speaking for, for everybody. You're not even necessarily speaking for anybody other than yourself. So maybe, you should, is, was that be an interesting thing to turn to everybody to see who was the first trans person story that you, that you heard of? Um, and where did you stand in relationship to that story? Uh, this is Tony from LA. Uh, Lady Chablis, the, the book, and then there was a movie with wow. her in it. Hiding my candy, is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I that read was that book. My first encounter uh, oh, with reading wow. and seeing a trans person, um, just like Jenny, uh, I am 20, 25 years on this journey. The 90s was when I kicked off uh, after I graduated from grad school. So that would be the first person that I, I read about. And then I saw her with the, uh, 
the, the, the Caucasian actor and they played again. Oh, it was just beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. So that would be the first encounter I had uh, with seeing a trans, reading a transgender book and also seeing that on TV, which now is a lot more prevalent with Pose and Laverne and others. But that was the first time I encountered a, a, a trans woman of color and reading a book. And it was amazing. And to see that book turn into a movie, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, I remember, I guess I remember watching Paris is Burning when I was 18 in college. Um, and I think I was exposed, I think I watched maybe like as a kid, I might have seen um, an episode of Donahue or one of those talk shows oh, with, um, with um, Carolyn Cossey, the, um, the, playboy, the playboy model who, who was eventually outed as trans. And I think those were, you know, like those were two early, um, you know, my two early encounters with, um, with trans women in America. Um, and I just remember, you know, like, I guess, like, I remember my experience feeling kind of refracted in the sense that, you know, like, in the sense that I saw glimpses of, you know, kind of, like, my nascent feelings about my gender, but they didn't really, you know, sort of, like, come to the fore for me until, you know, like, until much later, until, like, a decade later, something like that, so. Um, the first, um, I guess, trans book that I encountered was when I was like maybe 25, 26. I feel like I've just been really slow in life. <laughs> and I didn't like, to be honest, I didn't even know that there was like an LGBTQ like book genre. Um, mm -hmm. And so this was like the first like queer book, I guess. And it was by Leslie Feinberg, Stonebush Blues. Yeah. And I remember just like reading it on the plane and like weeping, just having such a huge reaction to this book. And you know, the weird thing about transness is I always, I mean, the joke I've sort of made is it's always felt like ecstasy. Like I felt like the ship had sailed for me. And if I was gonna, you know, transition, I should have done it in my, <laughs> my 20s, just like ecstasy. Um, but, you know, I think Tony, uh, sorry, uh, Leslie Feinberg's book was one of the books that really inspired me to, t to end up writing my first book because as much as I felt like a deep connection to Stonebush Blues, I also started thinking about the differences, you know, what it meant for me to grow up, uh, you know, in Edmonton, in, you know, in with like, um, you know, parents who are immigrants in like a Hindu uh, like household and, and all those differences um, was the thing that ended up inspiring me to tell my own story. But definitely um, Leslie Feinberg's book was, was, was the book that just, you know, in a lot of ways changed my life. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't actually think that there's a specific person. I think it was more like uh, impressions or people I would see. I grew up in, in downtown Manhattan and I would actually, and that was at a time when, you know, when there were still a lot of like working girls on the lower west side along the Hudson River um, around where the High Line now is. So I would just see people working um, and we wouldn't really talk about it but it was kind of in that childlike way I just also because I think I I had a really strong sense as a kid that I I didn't feel I was keeping a big secret you know <laughs> um and I would see women and I, w I think I would talk to my parents about it but I think I had like a really strong emotional response of some kind of like un unspoken identification um in that way that, yeah, that you do when you're a kid where you don't ever name the thing. And then all, and then I think the first time I started to understand what it was that I was seeing was I would stay home when I was sick and watch like, stay, watch like the Maury Povich or Montel Williams shows. And that was when they still would have these um, bits on those shows where, you know, a guy would find out that the girl he was in love with was born a man like that trope was still really present in uh, morning television shows and I would watch those all the time but again I didn't talk to anyone about it it's just like stuff I had big feelings about <laughs> and probably kept a secret you know
Uh, has everybody already answered that question? I guess so, yeah. So, Hello, you know, the past couple of Hello, didn't. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. Hello, didn't. I know. I thought somebody hadn't, and uh, I was just like, yeah. <laughs> I always struggle with these kind of first questions because I just don't remember the first 18 years of my life. So <laughs> I always just kind of like sit around and I'm like, well, uh, I feel like I was largely disassociated for the majority of my life because of uh, the vitriol I was experiencing as a gender nonconforming person. And so I'm sure that I like experienced moments of identification or recognition, but all of that is kind of gone. And so I think for me, the reason that I write so much is because like the real world has always felt unsafe and not stable. And that fiction has always felt much more real to me than reality ever. So I think for me, like my trans icons were like him from the Powerpuff Girls, um, <laughs> well, which we never really check in about their pronouns. And I, I think that's why I would be resentful too if three white cis women got to mon monopolize femininity, even though I was in a practical seven inch heel, come on. Um, so like <laughs> characters were always, I think, much more real to me than anything because I was just in so many ways like uh, escaping from reality uh, mm -hmm. or finding or transcending new realities. Um, one person who was really influential for me when I first started to come into my own gender nonconformity was Juliana Huxtable, who actually grew up in the same small town as me in Texas. So we went to high school together and she was a senior when I was a freshman. And so when she graduated, I added her on Facebook and I started to look at her photos in college and I was like, what is she doing? Like, I want to do that too. Um, so I think it was more sort of like local cues than it was like any sort of public figures at the time. Cool. And I'm sorry, I skipped over you before. Um, Vivek mentioned about like sort of the LGBTQ genre of, of publishing, which I think is a really interesting way of thinking about it. And, you know, I mean, when I was first coming along, there was a certain specific type of book that was being published about trans people. And often it was not written by trans people. It was written by cis people who were kind of, you know, giving their own spin on it. Like I remember Trans Sister Radio by, by uh, Chris Bojalian was like a huge big deal at a certain point. And like, you know, how, how do you feel like in the last like five, 10 years, the kinds of books that we can publish has changed and like, what, how the kinds of stories that we can tell and how we tell them. And did you, have you gotten any pushback from the publishing industry or readers or booksellers about telling the wrong kind of transgender narratives in, in your writing? I would really look, super excited to hear about this. No, I haven't received any pushback. Um, um, in fact, uh, I've had, you know, three publishers work with me on this, on make an offer for the second publishing of the book and the Black Trans Lives Matter um, has been a huge response. So um, things have changed. I, I mean, you know, we have a long way to go, but I've seen change in the last 25 years. Um, and um, I think we're on the right track. I, I see optimism um, with the LGBTQ writers, especially trans writers who are now writing their own work uh, and representing themselves from all races. Uh, um, I think that's great. Hmm. I mean, I think for me, one of the things I really struggle with is that publishers, if I pitch a book about being trans, um, they're actually quite interested in that. Um, you know, I went through a whole thing with uh, writing a children's book about raccoons. <laughs> um, and publishers were just, but they're like, no, but what about a children's book about gender? And I'm like, nope, I've already done that before. And they're like, no, but gender, gender. Um, so for <laughs> me, I think the thing that I, I just really struggle with is that like publishers, oh, if you're God. trans or if you're marginalized, they want you to talk about being marginalized and it, but they don't want your like book about raccoons. They don't want your, you know, sci-fi story or whatever. And I mean, I think that those, I'm seeing some changes in those respects. Uh, but I think that like, for me, that's, that's the barrier is just like, sh I think publishing, when they think of like diverse voices, the only way they know how to consume us is if we're talking about that particular identity, as opposed to like, let trans people tell whatever stories they want to tell. In the subtweet, um, you know, it felt really important for me to have trans characters, but um, 
but I was like, can I write a trans character where there's never a conversation about transition? There's never a, a you know, a, a conversation about coming out where the person sort of establishes trans from the get go. And really the reader only finds out if they're really playing attention, paying attention. Like it's sort of like disclosed, I guess, through like hashtags or whatever. And to me that felt like quote unquote, uh, hopefully it's not too grandiose to say, but a bit of a victory for me as a writer was to to see if I could write a trans character that, you know, whose character wasn't about their transness. Yeah, I mean, at least for me, there was definitely both ambient and um, explicit pressure that I felt to foreground um, the trans related parts of my narrative and background, whatever else, right? You know, the, the book for me has always been in terms of how I conceive the memoir has always been to interlink race and gender because they play such key roles and interconnected roles in my life among, you know, my other identities. And, um, and there, were, there were definitely, um, there were definitely figures in the publishing industry that resisted that, in part because the memoir tradition, which, you know, in America, which has been constructed around white cis experience, is for a book to be about just one thing, right? Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that was something that I definitely experienced. And I think similar to Vivek, I also um, was really adamant and have been really adamant throughout my career that, you know, that, that whenever I write about, um, you know, my life or anything that's translated, it's in the context of also, you know, of also expressing my ideas as a person and expressing the, you know, like the ways that I create and the ways that I write as a person, which I think trans people have, it's been very difficult for trans people to get to that point, right? Where we're not justifying ourselves through our writing or we're not writing for the benefit of cis people understanding our experience. And I feel like, you know, that I definitely see that tide shifting, right? Um, in the sense that there are more books that are written for us with, you know, like with an imagined cis reader as an observer rather than as a person that we're directly addressing in order for them to understand our experience. Yeah, so I, I wrote She's Not There over 20 years ago now and, um, or started writing some of it in, in, in the late 90s. And um, I came out at 40. Um, so, I mean, when I look at that book now, um, and there was kind of a revised, updated version of it um, 10 years after it was published. But when I look at that book now, I mean, first off, I feel really proud. Uh, I feel I, I'm really proud of the book. Um, I'm proud of it as as writing and as a piece of literature. Um, I, I like the way the stories all connect. I like the kind of joy in it. There's there's um, there's a lot of there's a lot of humor and goofiness in it. In addition to all the you know the tears and all the terrible things we all go through. But you know, it's a it's I think it's a it's a it's a hopeful book. But I can also tell you that when I look at it now what I hear is a voice of somebody who was saying to cis, like that book was written for cis readers. It was really not written for transgender people because I didn't know any of the transgender people, you know? I mean, I live in a cabin, <laughs> you know, with a bunch of bears, you know? I, I, um, you know, I, you know, um, so I, but when I, when I, when I look at that book now, there's this tone to it that I, that I can hear which is a tone of um, like apology or a tone of explaining myself, um, which kind of mirrors the experience that I went through when I came out in, in, in 99, 2000, the experience of going around to everybody I knew who are all straight people, who are all cis people and saying to them, I hope you'll understand. Here, let me explain the situation to you. Um, I hope I can count on your understanding and your love. And, and I mean, I didn't say this, but I think it was implied forgiveness. Like somehow my difference was something I, that I had to justify to them. And 
you know, and to some degree, I think there's there's a strength in kind of m making an argument in story for the dignity and um, you know and and the love in a transgender person's life. But if I look at what's being written now and Meredith's book, not least, because that's that's the one of the people here which I read most recently, um, that's what's changed in 20 years. It, that um, and, and not only on paper. That I mean, my daughter is trans. And when she came out, her sense of the world. I mean, she didn't. You know, she posted on Facebook, "Hey, everybody, I'm trans." Um, okay, bye. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, literally. I think that's. I think that's what what the whole quote was. Hey, everybody, I'm trans. Here's my new name. Okay, bye. Um, so the kind of opera of please, please forgive me, like that. That is. I don't want to say it's completely gone, but it's like it's largely gone. And so now people can come out. They don't have to apologize. They don't have to be on the defensive. They don't have to explain themselves. Uh, they don't have to live up to anybody's, um, you know, expectation for them except except their own and what they want and, and who we want to be. Um, and that's I mean that's really that's really cool. And I'm really glad. I I hope that. Well, and I'll let my voice fall. And that, that, that's the change that I've noticed. Um, and it, you have to think it's, it's progress. I think it's also, I mean, I think a lot about how, you know, publishing is an industry where in backdoor meetings, people with power are still saying phrases like women and people of color as a way of describing some diversity of perspectives outside of like the dominant voice. You know, like we are, this group of people is so far ahead in terms of the nuance and complexity with which we think about experience and identity than the majority of people who are making decisions in the realm of mainstream publishing. And that's the same in the entertainment industry and the same in most, in most industries where there's power. And I think what I feel so grateful to have come of age as a trans person surrounded by thinkers and leaders and movements that demand that I de that trans identity be understood as something more than just a gender experience, that it's always also a racial experience, a class experience, that there is no trans experience outside of these other, you know, building blocks of identity under capitalism. And I think, you know, we see that in Alok's most, in Alok's most recent book, which is this amazing accessible and I think in some ways unprecedented analysis of how there is no gender without an understanding of colonialism. There is no gender without an understanding of, you know, legacies of anti-blackness. Um, and so something that I found, and I say this very much as a trans person who is white um, and can pass as a, you know, as a, as a man and often is interpolated as having a binary gender, when I went into my publishing meetings, I was very clear, I'm not writing a book about the trans experience. I'm writing a book about what it, mean, what it meant to me to come into an understanding of my transness as a white person with class privilege. And it was fascinating to see how consistently they didn't want that second part, because I think what they're looking for is trans, and what they think they can sell is trans stories that imply that there's some universal umbrella of trans experience but what we all here know is that that's just absolutely not the case. Um, and it's gonna be a battle for any trans writer to say, I refuse to play into this assimilated, watered down bullshit notion of transness that you want me to. And I'm gonna stay true to the fact that what I have to offer is my story alone and the forces that have, have shaped that. I would add that I think that we're in this moment where people mistake looking at us as liberation and that's across the board um, where there's a kind of still scopic quality to trans life where we have to be a spectacle in order to be real and our analysis hasn't really made it there and i think what i was really trying to do in my book um, was to actually say i'm kind of done with just the 101 and we need to actually push a politics that's not just about trans people, but is about gender and an abolition of the gender binary. And I think so often um, people want to just make trans experience this kind of provincial uh, minoritarian kind of over there uh, subjectivity, 
But what I see, I think, at least my generation of trans writers trying to do is actually say, no, we are actually challenging gender as a system and as a project. Um, it's not just about my gender, it's about gender and that everyone has a gender uh, that needs to be interrogated. And so much of the crisis of anti-trans violence is actually cisgender projection and anxiety of themselves. And, and one thing I'll say around the, the publishing world, I'm sort of new to it. I think a lot of my work was self-published before because I wanted to avoid these dynamics. Um, and I think that there's many actually trans artists who are pursuing more DIY strategies for that very reason is um, there's a way in which I still feel we get segmented into like trans memoir or LGBTQ issue. Even though when I'm reading these books, I'm seeing people talk about universal profound treatises on human existence. And so I think we're still at this place now where we're not being taken seriously uh, for our intellectual caliber, for the political contributions, because we're just seen as speaking to a small minoritized community. And what I really like to see pushing forward is that we integrate trans perspectives, not just like in pride or as a sort of like um, spinoff series or collection, but that we understand that transness is part of everything. I, I wanna follow up with that. I, I was the ED and CEO of St. James Infirmary in San Francisco. And um, um, what, what you were just referring to, I noticed that um, we really have to focus on gender and a lot of people have not seen us at, in these boardrooms, um, in these meetings with the mayor and the governor before. And uh, I think that's really, um, for me, that's where I'm headed. Uh, being a law background, we've got to integrate um, and talk more about gender because they've got the, the trans thing in a little category. Mm. People view it in a certain capacity. Um, and we've got to, as a group, as a people, liberate ourselves more and to talk about not transgender, cisgender, but gender and really integrate ourselves into these meetings uh, where there's power. Um, we will not be liberated until we get to where the power is and can be a decision maker within that power structure. Um, it, that's just my viewpoint. I'm speaking for Tony. Uh, I have a law background and I think the law is where we should be going, running for offices, uh, getting power and authority to speak as a person, not as a transgender person, but a person. It's where I think we need to go to liberate ourselves for full equity and equality and diversity. Uh, and that's Tony Newman speaking in Tony Newman's voice. So <laughs> I'm not speaking for trans or black trans or people of color. I'm just saying that's what I see is important right now mm -hmm. to get power so that um, we can be integrated in the LGBTQ because uh, gays and lesbians have had power for a long time. Um, and trans is now trying to get into the block of getting power. I think that's where we, we should be going uh, and getting laws to support us that say we should get health care. We shouldn't be discriminated against. I think that's where we should be going. Yeah, and actually that's a great segue to the next question I want to ask. Meredith mentioned that we're kind of in an inflection point right now. I think that was before we got started. You know, the past couple of weeks have been kind of a roller coaster. The J.K. Rowling, Trump coming out with these really oppressive rules and then the Supreme Court ruling. It feels like we're at a moment where there's going to be a lot of, you know, there's going to be a, another backlash. There's going to be a lot of debate over how much, how much rights we should have, how much we should be respected. You know, the next few years are gonna be crucial. What kind of stories can we be telling? What can we be doing at this like really crucial moment to sort of let ourselves be seen as everything that we are and as full humans when people are trying to take away our rights? Well, I feel I like Alok always goes last, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping Alok could go first this time. Yeah. Um, I think I've been really concerned with how trans movements have actually been engaging in cisgender frameworks for a very long time. So what you see in trans communities still is this idea that being transsexual or medically transitioning is somehow more real or valid or true than those of us who are non-binary or gender non-conforming. And it rehearses this distinction of sex as a biological physical characteristic and gender as a cultural or discursive characteristic. 
actually neglecting how sex and gender are colonial characteristics that were created as part of a regime of white supremacy. And so what we're seeing with the Supreme Court legislation, uh, Supreme Court decision is an antagonism happening all across the world of people feeling like the biological category of sex is being erased by the discursive cultural political construction of gender. And this echoes anxieties of colonial powers for a very long time of accusing the very people who are being threatened as being the invaders and erasing um, the kind of natural order of law. And what I would really like to see us going farther is to demolish this idea that there's a real way to be and that there's a fake way to be and to get out of this authenticity, actuality kind of dialogue or artifice dialogue and to actually say, you know, you can be artificial and that's another way to live or you can choose your gender and that's another way to be, that's fine. And that our validity shouldn't be conferred by a system that distributes legitimacy on our ability to bring other people down. That's so much for me of what I believe trans liberation should be about is the assertion that all genders are valid and feminism should be fighting for all genders. And so I think I'm feeling concerned right now because I'm seeing how certain strains of trans knowledge production actually end up being absorbed in a way to police out other trans and gender non-conforming people. And in the same ways in which gay, cisgender, lesbian, cisgender people kicked out trans people historically with the human rights campaign and with employment non-discrimination because it was seen as too much. Now we're seeing gender non-conforming people be kicked out as too much. Still so much of the ways that we imagine policy, the ways that we imagine legislative intervention require us to have a fixed gender identity. Um, but what about those of us whose gender is unmoored from any sense of fixity? What about those of us who look like what society perceives as a woman one day, what society perceives as a man the next day, what society is no frame of reference for even within the same day? Mm -hmm. I think the emphasis needs to be less on individual transgender bodies and more on the systems that are gendering society. I'm sorry, Tony, you were starting to say something and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but. Well, I agree with what he's saying and, 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 and that got me to another point. You know, we used to have this thing and it's still here in the trans, uh, trans community about passing. And, and there, there has always been some discrimination with those that can pass and those that can't. But I, I, I think he's made a, a loc. I think they- Actually, a loc is, uses they, them pronouns. Yeah, I, sorry. I, I just saw yeah. that in the, in the caption, sorry. Um, no worries made a great point that we should get away from that um, and move forward as a unit. Uh, we're never going to get full equity and equality unless we can unify. Uh, one thing that lesbians and gays have done beautifully, even when lesbians didn't like gays, you know, 20 years ago, they unified to fight for marriage equality. I worked for EQCA when we lost it in California, we got it back. Unification and 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 Alok makes a great point that there is not enough unity. Right. Uh, there's black against white in our community. There's the nonconformity against the pre, the pre's against the post. It's just so much uh, disunity. And I'm hoping that during this revolution, we can unify, uh, no matter where you come from, except where they are, and let's all unify and fight together. We will not get any equality until we all group together. We must go as a, as, as a unified team. And, and I, I don't know how we're gonna get there until we can clear this up about pre, post, non-binary, um, mm -hmm. I'm trans, I'm transsexual. I mean, the, the language is all over the place. We've mm -hmm. got to get some unity before we can get full e e equality in the LGBTQ movement, <laughs> mm -hmm. before we can go to the cis movement. There's so much distraction, in our, in, in our, and I love us all, but there's so much distraction uh, and disunity uh, in our group. I see it all the time when I'm, I'm hanging out with different forms of our group, how A and B, it's, it's a lot of, a little dysfunction. Hmm. Um, one of the things that I grapple with a lot um, is trying to figure out um, the ways in which I, as an individual, can contribute to these movements. Um, I've been deeply, deeply influenced 
by Alok's thinking around these issues because you know that we've been friends for a really long time um, and I read their work consistently. One of the things that I've been really sort of especially you know like especially during this time especially during a time when I found myself deciding not to go into New York. I moved two hours away because of COVID while the protests were happening. You know, this time has really been, you know, one in which I've been um, just closely thinking about my role as a writer and a particular kind of writer who has a particular kind of, you know, like working for, um, you know, like working for general, quote unquote, general like, leadership publications. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, writing. No, I don't track you guys. Um, like when you like last access because like, I don't um, think there's somebody channel, who, but... yeah, hold on one second. Um, the, um, you know, like thinking about, uh, thinking about what it means to have a certain amount of like institutional privilege, right? Um, and I think that one of the things that I've really been thinking about is how to, how to navigate the, you know, this sort of capitalist publishing system that we're in, you know, to be able to produce work that, you know, that at once um, a readership that wouldn't necessarily be prepared to um, accept these ideologies at face value can, but when you write in such a way that those values and those ideologies are embodied and in such a way that people can then, you know, sort of absorb those ideas um, without them feeling like the ideas are, you know, like somehow whatever, like, being aggressively put forth or what have you, right? Um, it's something that I've, I'm thinking about a lot um, because I'm, I'm writing fiction right now and a lot of what Alok says is embodied in the fiction, mm. but I'm not necessarily, I'm not necessarily stating that up front, right? Like it, it is in the, and that was also a strategy that, um, that I employed in Ferris, in part because I've gotten really tired of, you know, like I feel like um, trans people, whenever we write, there's so much pressure for our writing to be related to a specific political moment, you know? And I feel like we're so rarely given space to just tell a story and be able to relay our experiences outside of or not outside of like everything is within but not um in relationship to the ways in which cis people are specifically threatening us um and and think more sort of holistically about what it means for us to be trans and what our politics are right um and that's something that i'm thinking about a lot right now Jenny? Uh, yeah, or yeah, Jenny, do you have anything to add? Um, I don't know that I do. Um, but I'm 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 I'll just say I'm very moved by by what I'm hearing. Yeah. Vivek, I feel like you haven't talked in a while. Yeah, I mean I don't really have a lot to add as well. I'm I'm also very moved and also inspired. Like sometimes, you know, I think I feel ill-equipped for these conversations because you know, technically I, f I formerly ca formally came out like four years ago. And so I, and I, like I said, I just feel so slow. So it takes me a lot of time to uh, <laughs> catch up, so to speak. But I mean, again, to reiterate my earlier point, I think for me, what I would love to see is trans creators, artists given the space to create work that they, that we want to create. Uh, and if that's about, you know, transition and gender, like I think that's wonderful, but I think I I'm really, hungry for trans creators <laughs> and for myself personally <laughs> to have the space to create work that isn't just about um, gender and uh, yeah or at least gender overtly. Cyrus? Mm -hmm. Hi I've relocated close quarantine quarters I've now moved into the closet 
So <laughs> went back into the closet. You're yes, not I'm, supposed to go back into the I'm closet. In, I'm in the closet, and I'm going to do my best from the closet. <laughs> Um, you're forcing uh, you in the closet. No, no, it's it's okay, Meredith. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I mean, it's the the timing of everything these past few months and everything stacked up on each other, and then the last few weeks, this you know this this uprising um, around police brutality and this and anti blackness and this call for abolition, and then to immediately go from that to the Supreme Court decision, which is so long overdue and is of course incredibly important, um, but also made me think a lot about, you know, anytime like transness makes certain policy strides, something that I always think about with policy is what does it mean to fight for policy that will, will, that will also leave people behind? And what does it look like when our political stakes always start from a place where no one is left behind? So what I've been thinking a lot about after the Supreme Court decision, which again is incredibly important, is you know, something that we know is that so many people who identify as trans, gender nonconforming, gender deviant, intersex, don't even have access to employment, let alone the category of the worker. You know, like we know that people in our communities historically survive through criminalized economies, through sex work, through drug sales, that at unprecedented rates, trans and gender nonconforming people, particularly people of color, are incarcerated, that the intersections of transness and disability are immense. And so I also I think like I'm very interested in a trans politics that doesn't see the worker as being like the center of its fight because we know that as long as the worker is what rights is where rights come from so many of our people won't have access to rights because so many of our people are never going to be workers because people don't want, you know you know even if it's allowed it's it's just not accessible it's not possible um, but I think so, it's that they are working. It's that their forms of work right. aren't legitimated. That, exactly. That's what I mean, is that they're not, it's not considered legitimate work. It's not considered legitimate employment. Um, you know, there's a reason that like union struggles and trans struggles have <laughs> historically been, you know, b best buddies. Um, and I don't say any of that to undermine the importance of this landmark decision, but just to say that moving forward, I'm so interested in, um, stories, analyses, um, positions, struggles that start maybe from the place of criminalization rather than seeking the protection that comes from defining oneself against criminalization. Mm -hmm. But push back on that, please. That's, you know, I'm, I'm, we're here to, to, to parse it out. So I'm really curious what other people think. Well, I agree. San Francisco, I think is, uh, we, we, they are drafting St. James and our policy director. We drafted um, and working towards decrim of sex work in San Francisco. And I think it will go to the board of supervisors in July and Mayor Breed, I think, will sign it. Uh, I'm working on that here in L.A. with the Office of L.A. Equity and Inclusion. So that's a positive thing to say that sex work is work uh, and, uh, um, uh, and they shouldn't be arrested for just trying to survive. Um, I did it in, in on 14th Street, which I wrote about 25 years ago. I wasn't out there for my health. I was out there to make a coin, as we used to say, make a, make a dime so I could survive. So, um, you know, these are the type of things that we should work towards to say sex work is work and decriminalization. Um, Camilla Harris, I think has turned the corner. Uh, we're trying to get her to turn the corner to say, you know, sex work is work and let's work on decrim. Um, cause that's really affecting my community of color more than in, in anything else. Uh, people of color who are trans are getting arrested for all kinds of bullshit, uh, and being loaded down with misdemeanors and then turned into felonies and being put in jail. And then they have a felony. They can't get a job. Um, blah, blah, blah. It's just a continual cycle that we need to stop. We need to really stop. So, yeah. And SESTA FOSTA has made it even worse for a lot of sex workers. We're almost out of time, but we had one audience question I wanted to make sure to ask uh, from Alexa. Uh, she wants to ask Alok and Vivek specifically, as she's also a trans person of Indian descent and wants to know how you navigate the disparity between the cultural connotations of being trans in India versus being trans in a largely white Western society. I know that's, that's a lot for the last like few minutes, but I thought, you know, I wanted to make sure I got to ask that.
Vivek, you want to go first? (laughs) 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 Sorry, Um, can you repeat the question? Yeah, basically, uh, our our questioner is also a transperson of Indian descent and wants to know how you both navigate the disparity between the cultural connotations of being trans in India versus being trans in a largely white Western society. Because obviously these things are kind of defined through culture and different cultures have different ways of, of kind of constructing them. I mean, I, I guess I, I'll say I'm, I'm always hesitant to, to make the connection just because um, I'm, I don't live in India. And so although I feel like all kinds of responsibility to like, you know, think about and ex- acknowledge like casteism, um, I think that there's ways in which both, you know, my experience as a diasporic South Asian, I can like romanticize India and also there's the pressure to um, critique. And so, you know, I find questions like this always just a little bit uncomfortable as someone who just like has never lived there. I will say that I think for me, you know, when I attended Pride in India a couple of years ago, one of the things that I found really different and super heartening was the ways in which um, it seemed like, and again, this is where it gets murky because like I was an outsider there, but like the conversations at least that were taking place uh, in relation to the Hijra community and trans people were so much more at the forefront um, than the conversations that I was seeing here. I mean, again, this was like, God, five, 10 years ago. Uh, but for me, that felt really heartening and also inspiring. And I think it's, it speaks to some of the, the, the points that were made earlier in which the ways in which uh, trans voices in like, I guess like the North American uh, LGBTQ movement has have been like not foregrounded in the same way. But again, I'm hesitant to make that observation as someone who like attended <laughs> two pride marches. Um, yeah, I don't know. Alok, I don't know if you have more to add. Well, I don't think you're, you're giving yourself enough credit because I feel like in your, even in your diasporic work, you're totally trying to create an archive for South Asian trans and queer people. Vivek and I were actually in a music video together for one of their <laughs> songs, so you should check that out. Um, what I would say is for me, it's been really helpful to build relationships with trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming communities in India themselves. And so through like various partnerships with organizations and activists there, I'm always just learning, 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 and seeing how it's like such a different political conversation. Um, Right now, there's actually a bill in India, the transgender bill, which is just awful and draconian that the government passed and a lot of trans hijra Koti Aravani communities have been resisting it. And so I've been sort of trying to follow what they're saying, how they're speaking about transness. And I think it's a broader point of U.S. movements are actually behind a lot of the kind of political asks that are being made from the global south, especially from trans sex workers in the global south. And so I think it's so important that we actually learn from trans movements outside the U.S. on what to inform our asks by. So like related to what Cyrus was speaking about in labor, in a lot of places in India, there's actually affirmative action policies specifically for trans and gender non-conforming people. University programs, jobs that are specifically for trans and gender non-conforming people, demands for economic justice, things that we would never be able to even like put on the table here are just seen as kind of customary there. And so what would happen if we actually learn from leaders outside the US to inform what we think is possible? Cool, and I I know Vivek has to get going because she has another thing to do right now, but uh, you know, uh, everybody else, if you just wanna share a final thought about, you know, what you would like to leave people with today. I, I really love that. And then we probably should wrap up pretty soon anyway. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. So sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank Bye. you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Um, anybody else? Final thoughts? Uh, Cyrus, Jenny, Meredith? Well, I think, um, I guess, you know, just jumping off of Alok's point, um, you know, like I, in a different context, I also, you know, like live between these two cultural contexts and political frameworks, right? Um, As somebody who um, grew up in the Philippines and also um, have spent a lot of time reporting there. And one of the things that that has been really striking to me about a Philippine context 
is the ways in which um, cis women and trans women um, and gender nonconforming people in the Philippines are so much more closely allied than they are in an American context. Um, so when Jennifer Laude, who is um, this Filipino trans woman um, who was murdered by a US Marine um, in 2014, the, all of those groups came together, you know, pretty organically, seamlessly, and, and really, really closely and worked together, you know, to be able to, um, you know, to be able to bring uh, her murderer to justice, right, in ways that feel impossible or feel very, very difficult in an American feminist context where I feel like the language is so much about inclusion, is so much about you know, like that, that cis women own feminism or, you know, they treat feminism like it's their property, that they are gatekeeping um, other, um, other people into. Um, and actually, I think specifically like white feminists, right? Um, and, so, and so definitely um, observing those different contexts has been super, super beneficial for me, um, both as a trans person and as a writer, because I also find myself being in a better position to question what is going on in an American context when I have a comparative experience. Thanks, Meredith. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot to add at the end here, but I, I'll, 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 I'll tell you this much. When I'm, I'm kind of fundamentally a shy person, actually, um, and a slightly fearful person. And um, the idea of being um, a fighter for anything was something that I, I never really wanted to be because I didn't think I could, because I just didn't think it was a thing that I had the skill to do. And it's probably in some, in some ways, it's still not. Um, uh, you know, when I, when I published my first book, my thought was, you know, I'm going to write this one book about being trans and that's it. And I'll go back to writing novels. There. That's done because clearly there's nothing more to say. And no one else ever needs to publish a book either because clearly I've, I've now, that's now taken care of forever. Um, what I realized, um, well, obviously, obviously I was wrong. <laughs> but more importantly, what I realized, I mean, I think I didn't want to call myself an activist early on because when I thought of being an activist, I thought of, you know, all the all the protests I went to in the 70s. Um, I thought of like, it was it meant like I was going to chain myself to the fence or something. Um, and I'm not, believe me, I'm, I'm not, I'm not against chaining yourself to a fence when the occasion calls for it. And if ever there was a time that called for it, it's now. But what I felt like, what I could do was tell a story. Um, and so what I'm, I guess what I'm saying to the people who are, the writers who are here, who already know this, and everyone else who's, who's just joining us, writing is a great form of activism. Writing is a great way to change the world. And I mean, there are other ways of doing it too. If you're, if you're a, a shy person, um, telling your story is a really powerful thing you can do. And it's, it's a thing you can do from your, from your house. You can write your story. And then you can publish your story. And whether that means that, you know, you're writing for the New York Times or you're publishing a book at Random House, or whether it means you're self-publishing and you're putting your stuff up on your blog or on Medium or, or anywhere where people can get to it, that's not important. What's important is that the stories get told and lots of different stories get told. And that really is how we change the world, um, one story at a time. Um, so I wanted to say that. and the, the, connected to that is the second thing I wanted to say, which is to remind everybody that we're here today um, to support Adobe Books, an independent bookstore um, in um, San Francisco. And um, if you want to buy any of our books, um, it would be great if you do it through Adobe. Um, you can find the website. Um, uh, I'm sure, I mean, Charlie can give you more information. There's lots of information in the chat bar. Um, but if you want to see the power of stories being told, you can read the stories that are for sale at Adobe. And you can not only 
help our movement, but you can also help an independent bookstore that probably needs all the help you can, you can get right now. Yeah. Anybody else? Final thoughts? Tony? No, I just, I just would tell okay. everybody to be their authentic self and whatever your expression is, whether it's writing, music, do it. Don't be shy. Put yourself out there, baby. Um, and just uh, be your authentic self. And guys, I have to go. I have a two o'clock. Okay. Me too. Peace and love. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you to everyone so much. Bye. And Bye. Uh, it was posted in the bar, but uh, next week, Rebecca Sklut and Ed Young, we're doing an event for East Bay booksellers. It's going to be super freaking amazing. We can find all our book events at welovebookstores.org. And thank you, and we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.